Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to True Crime with the Sarge. I'm your host, Joseph Jacqueline, and tonight we have a very special guest, or actually this morning or afternoon, depends on which coast you're on. If you're watching us live right now, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to introduce retired homicide lieutenant Gil Carrillo from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. All right, a lot of people get that wrong. I want to talk about that too. What, what's the difference between the two? Because many people don't understand the difference. But Gil, thanks for coming on and welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on your show, Joe. Oh, this is great. So we're going to jump into it. I know as a kid, many of us said we wanted to do some sort of civil service work, policing, whatever. Was that in the plans for you? Can you tell us how you got involved in the whole no, as, as a kid, it wasn't. Matter of fact, the law enforcement got in touch with me. There was a cop out there, and he took me home and told my parents, sign for him to get off the streets or he'll end up in prison or dead. And uh, I was 17 years old at the time, and so my parents took his advice. They signed for me, and I wanted to go. So I went into the Army, ended up in Vietnam. A year of combat changed my whole outlook on life, gave me a new appreciation on life and uh, matured me. When I got out of the army three years later, uh, I, I wanted to become a cop because I wanted to give back what that guy had given me, that cop gave to me, and that was, he gave me my life back and I owed everything to him. I wanted to go to college. Uh, nobody in my family, no siblings, no relatives, nothing had ever gone to college and I wanted to go to college. Now, uh, at that time I was naive. I thought college was for rich white people and you know, I didn't have any of my buddies going, no Mexicans going to college. I wanted to go when I got in. They had to let me go because I was a uh, combat veteran. And so I got into local community college. That's where I started my college. And then unfortunately, the third one, not so good. I wanted to start dating my ex-girlfriend who had dumped me when I was in Vietnam. Give me a dear John. I wanted to come back. Uh, revenge was going to be mine. I wanted to get her eaten out of the palm of my hand, then break it off with her like she had done to me. Uh, I... Got out in June. By September, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. And the day after Christmas, we got married. <laughs> and so this year, we'll be celebrating 53 years together. Wow, that's fantastic. And listen, thank you. yesterday was Veterans Day, so thank you for your service. Oh, um, you know, yeah, Veterans Day, we always have to make sure we thank thank veterans for everything that you did. And, uh, you know, from the Vietnam perspective, too, we know there was a lot of issues historically um, that, you know, you guys had problems when you came back home. But uh, thanks again for your service for that, too. So you actually do double duty, right? So you have the military and the police, and you have all this stuff that ends up going on that we're going to get into eventually. But it's just, um, you know, just one of those things. I mean, everybody kind of has that one career moment, right? And this one happens to you. Richard Ramirez, we're going to get into the story, but this one happens to be yours. Here we are. What is it? 30 years late. 30. How many years later? That was 1985. Well, the year was. So, so, 85, almost, so you, you figure 85. I'm not a math. This is what we're going on. Yeah, so you're 38 years. years. Yeah, 38 years later. So, and, and people still want to talk about this and do it because it's actually uh, interesting. And actually, law enforcement can learn a lot about this investigation. And uh, I want to touch on that. But what? So, you, you get you usually you take the test for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Is that is that how it went, went back then? Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and Los Angeles Police Department, two different agencies, are the two biggest agencies in Los Angeles County. And so, I applied for both of them. Uh, whichever one was going to take me first, if I made it. Uh, as the agency I wanted to go to. Uh, the realities are I wanted to go to LAPD better because I like I like their uniforms. They look better in <laughs> uniform than, than the Sheriff's Department did. The Sheriff's Department called me and uh, I spent 38 years with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And the only difference being is uh, we, we all do the same kind of work, same crimes. Uh, everything's the same. They're a little more... Uh, they, you know, it's kind of like the Marines in the Army. You see commercials on TV, you know, the Marine Corps. I mean, they get a lot of press and they're they're good. They're good at what they do and they make them look good. And you don't get that much from the Army. But yet they all do the same job. Uh, the only thing we don't do is we don't fly jets. They fly, they have some guys that are pilots that fly jets. But everything aside from that, we both go into combat. We both have infantrymen, helicopters. Within the law enforcement, the only thing separating us from them is a jurisdictional line separating. The Sheriff's Department is responsible for all unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County, as well as those incorporated cities that contract through us to do their work. And so normally on a right now, and I don't know what the numbers are right now because both departments are, are dying because people keep living, leaving 
uh, law enforcement here, but normally we're, we're right around between 9,500 and 10,000 uh, sworn officers. Uh, and both, you know, sometimes we're ahead, sometimes they're ahead, but it's all the same kind of work. Uh, they make an arrest out in the field. They call a sergeant out there to go ahead and approve their arrest before they take them in. Uh, on the other hand, we make an arrest. We make the arrest. We take it into the station and convince that sergeant why it's, why it's a good arrest. But he's there. They're all the same. Right. But a lot of people get confused. I mean, I, I even heard on a couple, you know, watch a couple interviews with you. that They don't know the difference between the two. I know there's a difference. I don't, I've never been out to L.A. yet, but I know about the jurisdictional lines and, and those kind of things. But, in, you know, on the East Coast, we don't have to worry about that kind of thing. You know, yeah, yeah you're lucky. It was it. Yeah. But we actually, when I first got on the police department, we had a transit police and a housing police, which were different agencies. They were run by the feds. So we did have those jurisdictional issues, but you know, unlike what you guys had to deal with, it was a much larger area than, than we had to deal with. We had two you know, pockets, just transit hubs and housing. So all we what, have between us now is friendly banter that goes <laughs> back and forth between, and, and that's at the lower level. I mean, it, but it's all good. We protect each other. We back each other up in a heartbeat. It's all law enforcement. Right. And, you know, L.A. being L.A., you guys have come, covered many cases, including, I mean, you had the Hillside Strangler and then right into the Hillside Strangler, you go right into, you know, the Night Stalker case. How long did it take you to get into the, the homicide division or bureau when you when you were doing this? I, I'm not. And, and another difference, uh, one more difference between LAPD and the Sheriff's Department. LAPD has homicide investigators at every station and then they have one homicide unit. It's downtown. That's robbery homicide. And those are like for the big boys from Dover. The O.J. Simpson was handled by station uh, detectives until downtown found out, hey, that's Mark. That's O.J. Simpson. They come down and they take over the case. It's the big boys. Sheriff's Department has one centralized homicide bureau, and it doesn't matter where the case, as long as it's our jurisdiction, uh, you could be handling a millionaire's murder today and you could have a ta transient death tomorrow. It doesn't make a difference. We handle them. We handle them all. It takes an average uh, minimally of 15 years to get up to sheriff's homicide. It's supposed to be creme de la creme. It's the best of the best. And it's hard to get in. When I went in, I had nine and a half years and they called me up and asked me to go up there and work with them. They had just started uh, a gang unit that was going to be uh, there for strictly deep, strictly investigating gang murders. And I was a gang specialist when I came on the department. Due to my background before I came on the department, it was easy for me to go work in gangs. I was working gangs, and they wanted my expertise in homicides. And that was my dream was to one day work homicide because those were the guys that we all looked up to. They were creme de la creme. Uh, I, I just, that's what I wanted to do. And so nine and a half years for me, but that certainly is not the norm. Normally about 15 years to get to sheriff's homicide. Right. Uh, that's actually an interesting part of it when you think about it from the gang perspective, right? I mean, probably many, uh, large percentage of the homicides that you had to deal with were gang related. So it actually becomes a nice, that's right. nice kind of fit in there. And, and they are tough to, they're tough to solve because, you know, Generally, gang members don't want to help the police out. In they don't. Other cases, not. Everybody's afraid to get involved because they don't want them to be the next victim. They don't want to be a rat. They're afraid of everything, and so it's tough. You don't know whether they're they're afraid of being uh, retaliation from the gang members, or they're afraid of the cops, and they're afraid if they're undocumented na uh, nationals, they, then they're afraid we're going to deport them. So it's it's a big mess. It's troublesome. Yeah, and it's the same actually everywhere and, and doing it. And a lot of people don't understand that. They say, how come the police can't solve these cases? Because nobody wants to help. Everybody yeah. is afraid. Everybody wants to do that. So when, as you're in the homicide squad and you're, you're a young guy in there and, you, and you're, you're making your way, what was your philosophy on you know the homicide investigations part? Uh, first off, become a student of everything you got to learn, you know, and how to read crime scenes and how to read people and uh, but then it's just having, I, I had the advantage before going to homicide, I'd, uh, which I owe a lot of the Night Stalker case to uh, a professor by the name of Bob Morneau, who was a retired FBI agent, 
and he taught uh, advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes. But what he did do is he taught me to be a better uh, investigator. And that was, you have to have the understanding when you talk to these guys and talk to people, understanding that there's a reason they did what they did, whether it kill somebody, rob somebody, whatever they do, there's a reason for it. Understand what that reason is. And it just makes it easier to talk with them. You know, I I talked to Richard Ramirez like we were old friends or something. Uh, nobody ever has ever seen me blow up and get mad, start cussing and uh, doing any of that stuff. I'm not I'm not an angel, but I have understanding why they did it. And it just makes it easier to communicate with them. And the, the second part was being able to listen. You have to hear what people are saying without thinking of your next question, without writing something down. You have to concentrate on listening. If you do those things, that'll that'll help you out becoming a uh, good investigator. And that's what gave me the, the start. Then it was learning, applying myself on how to read crime scenes properly. It's great advice for you know any long, young law enforcement officers out there or detectives. Yeah, you have to be patient with people and you have to be able to do this. And I always say, like, why would you treat this person unfairly? Now you're going to want them to ask you to ask them questions for a favor. It just never made any sense to me. Sure. You know? It, sure. just, it just never did. But, uh, you know, that's that's some great advice. I hope those that are watching it listen to that advice. And you, it's actually for really every day walk of life, too. It's kind of um, interesting. So let's take everybody back to St. Patrick's Day, 1985, March 17th, 19, 19, March 17th, 1985. So this kind of kicks off before you, you know, before this is the case that kind of kicks off the Night Stalker investigation, but we still don't know it's the Night Stalker yet, right? We were just, yes, we're right. just going through all this stuff. So could you walk us through that day? Because it, it was there was more than was one incident that day. There was two that that evening. And, and the first one uh, came in at 1040. I was at home. It was St. Patrick's Day. As you said, uh, I'm home in bed. They called me up. They said, you got a murder, 8510 Village Lane. And uh, so I know where I'm going. And I get out there. They wake up my partner. We're both at our respective homes. I get there before my partner, and it's a condominium complex. And what has happened is Maria Hernandez uh, had a roommate by the name of Dale Okazaki, and Dale Okazaki was home already. Maria Hernandez was just driving in. She drove down a little alleyway and up into her garage. She has an automatic garage door opener. She opened the garage door. She drove her car inside, got out, and started going towards the door leading into the condo proper. Now, as she did that, just when she arrived at the door, she keyed the door and she unlocked it. Then she hit the button on the wall, which closes the garage door itself. She has eight seconds until that garage door closes and it gets pitch black in there. And so she keyed the door. All of a sudden she heard a deliberate noise the individual, I'll just call him Richard. Richard slammed the top of the car because there was another car parked in there. Slammed the, the roof of the car with his hand, which made her turn around. And then he looks at her and she's he's coming right at her point shoulder. Uh, Bob Morneau says that most of the time people stick a gun in your face. It's not because they're going to kill you. It's because that's foreplay. That is sex to them. That's why I learned this in the advanced criminal investigations pertaining to sex crimes. He said, that is foreplay. They want to see the fear in your eyes. They want to see the fear in your face. And all of a sudden, Richard pulled the trigger. She put her hands in front of her face, and Richard pulled the trigger, and the bullet went in her hand, struck a key. She had her house keys in her hand, struck the keys, went into her hand and didn't exit. She knocked her down. She went down to the ground. He can't see. He will later tell me that he thought he was in hell and was dead because his ears were ringing. He saw the flash and then it went pitch black. And he said, shit, I'm in hell. Then he reached over and he grabbed that door, which was already unlocked, pushed her out of the way, opened the door and went inside the condo. She then springs to her feet, hits the garage door opener on the wall again. It opens up the garage door. She goes out the garage, starts walking down the alley. When she hears a second gunshot and she's concerned because Dale Okazaki, her roommate, is inside the condo. She goes around the building to the front of the building and Richard comes out the front door. Instead of going out the garage, he went out the front door 
he is just as surprised to see her as she him because he she figured he'd come out the garage door again and there's a Volkswagen down there and the condo at this point from the front side is that the front door is about three feet higher than the ground level down on the ground level where she's at he's up on the high sidewalk he sees her then he goes down to the street level where she's at and they start playing cat and mouse running moving around his Volkswagen bug you know, he doesn't shoot her till he wants to get right on her. And finally, you understand Maria. She just puts her hands up in the air and says, hey, you already shot me once. Don't shoot me again. He put the gun down by his side, turned around and walked away. Didn't run, walked away. And so they, by this time, I got one dead. Maria's in the hospital. That's how I got the case. So it was my turn to be up. While I'm there, uh Deputy on the outside opens the front door and said, hey, uh, Gil, there's a lady out here that would like to talk to you. And I said, OK, just give me two minutes. Let me finish this measurement up and I'll be right there with her. Well, he left the door open and I'm silhouetted because it's light on the inside of the apartment, inside the condo. I can't see outside because it's all dark out there. And all of a sudden I hear this voice, a female voice saying, Gilbert, is that you? And I'm sitting here saying, hey, they called me Gilbert when I was a kid. I'm cool now. Now I'm just Gil. Who's calling me Gilbert? I said, yes, it is. Who am I talking to? And she goes, it's me, Pauline. And then I said, pumpkin? And she said, yes, pumpkin. I said, come on. So I walked to the door, met her. She was the mother of Maria Hernandez. What a small world this is. My parents were Maria's godparents. Pauline lived about three doors down from me. She, she had lived there. She grew up there on the block. And uh, she had, her name is Pumpkin. And so I said, Pumpkin, what's going on? Maria's my daughter. This is going on. I hadn't seen Maria since she was about six years old. I mean, six months old. My parents baptized her. Uh, Pumpkin ended up getting divorced. She married uh, someone else, moved away, and I never saw him again. Well, now here it is. It's her daughter that I'm going to be investigating the case on. While we're out there, about 50 minutes later, two miles away maybe by crow's flight, uh, there's another murder, Sai Lin Yu. She was drug out of her car, hit twice in the abdomen, and left in the street. There was no robbery at either place. There was no sex at either place. Uh, but Richard would tell me later, if you put up a struggle, you got killed. If you didn't, uh, you acquiesced to his commands, he let you live. Well, you could hear, according to the informants, they thought it was a boyfriend-girlfriend dispute. You could hear her yelling at him, why are you following me? Why are you following me? Well, he, he had been following her. And he had a lust, according to... Uh, one of his uh, friends, one of his, one of our informants, and Richard, he thought uh, number one, he loved Asian women. And you mentioned Asian women, he just go, you know, he he loved the way they look, and he said they had better booty, not their buttocks, but loot. They had better booty than most people. They had good stuff, and he thought that because they were Asian. Cops didn't give a shit. Wouldn't look, wouldn't work them that hard. He was surprised because we did. We don't care. And those were his thoughts. And so he he lusted after Asian women and he broke into a lot of ho- Asian houses along the way. Yeah, because like many of the victims in this are Asian that are that go through this whole thing. Was it about uh, was it thirteen homicides and then another dozen rapes or so on top of that? Yeah, we we filed. Originally, there were 14 murders. We dropped one in the interest of justice uh, because they were going to sever that one. And because there wasn't any physical evidence linking him to any of the other ones. Like the other ones, we all found links to, to make sure that they all were interconnected, either uh, either through ballistics or through the shoe print that was uh, used. Um some type of physical evidence that we could put him there. Uh, Patty Lane Higgins, which occurred on June the 28th of 1985, there was none of that. We did have a witness that uh, could put Richard, oh, about 40 yards away at at an intersection. He was waiting for the red light. And 
it came to her attention. She was drawn to him because that night he had a cat on his shoulders around his neck. And this lady was an animal lover. And she said, aren't you afraid that that cat will jump off and run into traffic? And she said he turned around and gave her this glaring look that scared the bejesus out of her. She just turned and walked, you know, got away as quick as she could. But she could put him there. Inside the uh, duplex that Patty Lane Higgins lived in, she didn't have any cats. And we found, the lab found black and gray cat hair, which was described as the color of the cat. And they were cat hairs. So we had filed on them. And her murder looks just like the murder that happened uh, four days later up there in, in uh, Arcadia of uh, an adult by the name of Mary Cannon. Her throat was slit. There was blunt force trauma and her throat was slit almost to the point of decapitation. And that's the same way Patty Elaine Higgins was. We knew they were connected, but there was nothing physically we could put. They wanted to sever the case and the district attorney made it simple. He said, let's just dismiss it in the interest of justice. Let's proceed with the remaining 13 now. And so that's what we did. Right. So on that, on that, that uh, St. Patty's Day night, though, when you looked at those two cases, did you have any idea that those two might be related, the Maria Hernandez case and then the attempted, like, carjacking no, or whatever you want not, to call no, it? No, not that night. We got ours at 1040. Theirs happened uh, 40 or 50 minutes after ours. But we didn't know about it till the following morning. We heard about it. It was the same caliber weapon, but the bullets were so mashed up we couldn't match them right away. You'd have to find a gun uh, to go with it. But I thought there was a possibility they were uh, related. One was, our victim was Japanese. The other victim was Chinese. And down in LA, Japanese and Chinese don't mix. You know, you don't see them together. They don't uh, coexist. But you're looking at two similarities could be a potential pattern at that case, or just because it was there, you know, the high population of Asians within the community. So it really, you know, couldn't have been maybe a pattern. Yeah, we didn't think of a pattern at all that first night. That, that was uh, that first, you know, that program that's on TV, the first 48. First 48, you're concentrating on what you got to work with right there. So we worked that night, the early morning hours after processing it. Uh, and then the next morning, we're at the hospital interviewing uh, Maria Hernandez. We had, she had gone through surgery and we couldn't get to her that night. So start out the next morning, let's get out there and start talking to her and uh, canvassing the, uh, neighborhood see if we could find anything that might be more so we're busy with ours you know you and when he killed the, the second one that he did was in the city of monterey park which is an incorporated city that has their own uh police agency they do their own murders and uh so we'd consult with them down the road but not right now let's work on ours and that's that's what we did and you, you look at the, you know, the people, I don't, I don't think really understand the complexity of this when you look at it because of the fact that the MOs were so different on so many of the cases, right? There's children, there's abductions, there's slashing of throats, there's shootings. I think generally most people would say this is several different killers. Yeah, they, they did. And I heard that. Uh, I wrote a search warrant dated April 10th where I tried to connect uh, three or four mur three murders and uh, I tried to connect four murders and about four child abductions. Where now I'm believing that one man is doing it because now the other thing that we haven't addressed, we haven't talked to on your show yet, uh, a footprint. A footprint shows up on the double homicide of uh, the Zazara family. And it was husband and wife. And she was an attorney, he was a businessman. And there was a shoe print later identified as the Avia. Right. Now, and doing a study on the Avia shoe itself, I can tell you today without equivocation that on January 9th, 1985, 1,356 pair of Avia Model 440s entered the fine state of New York for distribution throughout the U.S., of which six pair ended up in the state of California. One pair ended up in the city of Los Angeles. So when you're looking at that and we see that footprint at child abduction cases, and then we listen to the physical description that everybody's talking about, I'm saying one man is doing this. And most people, I'd say, you know, these commercials, you see nine out of 10 doctors or 99 out of 100 doctors. Well, if you'd ask around Homicide Bureau, my Homicide Bureau and all around, cops all around, it would be 
nine out of ten say that I'm full of hot air. Yeah, you know that that I was that I was wrong. My theory was wrong. We had a meeting at uh, the city of Monterey Park, and it was cops here from LAPD, cops here from Mon the city of Montebello, another incorporated city that does their own investigations. Uh, we had a detective from Pico Rivera, which was the sheriff's department, but he was there to talk about his attempt child, child abduction. And LAPD, they had representatives there talking about their child abductions. And I was there trying to link these things together. And they allowed me to make the present my, my presentation and my pitch. And there was a guy from the FBI there, a guy from the FBI uh, whose name was David Granish. And David uh, was to take all the paperwork that the investigators gave him and take it back to Quantico, Virginia, or send it back to Quantico, Virginia, the Behavioral Science Unit of the FBI. And so he sent all the everybody else's paperwork. When my captain called the FBI in uh, late June, early July, he called up and said, where's all the help that the FBI is supposed to be offering departments. My guys gave you the paperwork a long time ago. We haven't heard anything. And that's when we found out that David Grandish took it upon himself. He thought I was full of hot air. So he never sent my paperwork back to the FBI. Just ignored it. Like I was way out in left field with the theory that I was coming up with. Most guys in my bureau did not believe it because it didn't, these profiles that they make are based on criminal history. Well, to this day, nobody in criminal history had ever been documented doing what Richard, what I was alleging Richard was doing. And his only consistency was his inconsistency. As you said, one time it's a child victim, next time it's an adult. His victims range in age from five to 85. Sometimes he used uh, blunt force trauma. Sometimes he used knives. He used ligature. He used, he stomped somebody with his foot, you know, shod foot different caliber guns. They at back in, in those days, they FBI would classify serial killers as organized and disorganized. You were either one or the other. Richard was both. The organized has the tools of his trade on him when he went in there and he'd use his own Richard pack two guns every time he went in. And while he was in there, he would use a gun. Sometimes even though he had his guns with him, he used a knife from the house. On a couple of occasions he used Weapons that he used from inside the house. He used a hammer from inside the house. Ligatures from inside the house. Sometimes he took handcuffs with him, so he had handcuffs. Uh, on William Doy, uh, he used thumb cuffs, which is something that is used in Asia. So he was just different. And trying to convince people that it was one man was a difficult job. Yeah, I can certainly under I can certainly understand and understand their their uh, you know plight in this whole thing because when you look at it, because even had some were sexually assaulted, others weren't, and you know sure. you're dealing with little kids and all this stuff too, and the mo's are just off the charts. So boys, you know, and he, girls, and he yeah, also and that, just different. Yeah. And it's different. So let, let's talk about the, the shoe print. It's the Avia shoe print. I know this becomes really important to the case. It also gets blown up at the end. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly, too, because we don't want to get too much into politics. But the issue that comes down to is this Avia shoe. Now, to, to get that information about how many pairs of shoes were sent, and then you find out there was one pair, Los Angeles County, like how long did it take? to do all that information back then. I mean, today, and this is without computers and databases and everything else. This is like prehistoric times for the for, for people, some of the people watching today. We sent uh, somebody from our crime lab, we sent him up uh, to Oregon. There's a tra track and field coach up there by the name of Jerry Stubblefield. And Jerry had the patent on the Via shoe. So once we found out it was in the Via shoe, then we went to him. He's the one that gave us all the records of where it had come in. He did have records. Uh, that's how it was able to come in. We put two investigators on it, and they came uh, they came through with all the information on, on the shoe print. And he also gave our guy from the lab some soles, physical soles, not the whole shoe, just the sole, so we could work with it in the lab. Uh, he also sent uh, a few of us. Model 440 Avia, so we could have them for ourselves. <laughs> and uh, 
the difference was these were everybody's describing a black shoe and we only found them in white and so i bought a pair of white ones uh just for the case and i tried get, getting some of this shoe dye and all it made for was a ugly pair of shoes because we couldn't get the dye on there to cover to look pretty like a regular shoe would uh, then we found out that he made them in black that's why so few uh were were made and the only record we couldn't find uh was once it got to arizona arizona had that's where their big five headquarters was and uh they didn't have accurate tracking records where they sent them out from there but we didn't need them we found our guy uh where he bought them we bought them right at the right there right next to the greyhound bus depot downtown la the guy had one pair and he sold them it's amazing, right? How much uh, today with computers, you could probably get that kind of information at, at the bunch of your, you know, your fingertips. Sure. How many crime scenes did the shoe show up in? Because it had happened more than once, correct? It happened. It showed up in March. It showed up at a child abduction of uh, Maria Sandoval. It showed up at the house of Mary Cannon. Showed up uh, Whitney Bennett. Uh, showed up at Joyce Nelson. Uh, showed up of. Uh, Asian couple right now. Their name slips me out in uh, Sun Valley. Uh, it showed up uh, at William and Emily Doy's house. That's six. Uh, that's eight. eight right there. Eight. Yeah, that's at least eight different uh, times it showed up. It and showed up now in one house where the, the lady didn't die. It was a straight burglary. But in breaking into the house, he went in through the kitchen and he stepped on the kitchen sink. And he left a footprint there, and that was before he started using gloves. Nobody was injured on this. It was, and he used a hand to steady himself. So we got a handprint and a shoe print at the same location, and we didn't charge him with a burglary. We just used it as evidence uh, because nobody was hurt there, and we didn't want to charge him with any lesser crime. We wanted, didn't want to get distracted and lose the murders. And is it that's the point when you have the shoe print and all these crime scenes and then the ballistics start coming back and everyone kind of says, hey, Gil, you're right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. Uh, the captain had come in. We had been doing a we, – we called for a surveillance on a guy, and we followed him around, and we hit his house, and he wasn't our guy, and we knew it. So we went and we grabbed some food with the surveillance team. We ate off the old-fashioned way, off the hood of our radio cars out there, right by a cemetery where nobody had bothered us, just got together and we're talking. And my partner, Salerno, who had been the lead investigator for the Sheriff's Department on the Hillside Strangler, uh, he's telling me, you know, Gil, I think there's, we have a series within a series. He thought there were two guys working in the same area, just not acquainted with each other. And I said, I don't think so, Frank. You know, but although we don't have any evidence to disprove that, I just don't think so. The next morning we went into work and the captain came in. Now the captain had asked me early on, had asked Frank, is there a serial killer? This is right after the April search warrant that I wrote. And Frank said, nah, there's really nothing there. You know, so they didn't put much credence in a serial killer at that time. Now that all this shit's going on, now they know they got a serial killer. And after we did this, this other uh, surveillance with, to no avail, Captain came in the next day. He says, what do you think, Frank? And Frank said, well, boss, last night, Gil and I were talking, and we think there's this could be a possibility of a series within a series, two guys work in the area. And he looks at me and he says, what do you think, kid? And it pissed me off because that's not what I was thinking. And I said, we can't discount what Frank says. We have no physical evidence going either way, so... I can't discount that. He says, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, what are your thoughts? And I blew up and I started pointing fingers at, I said, I told you it was one motherfucker. God damn it. And I, and I stopped. I said, so I, I really can't say. And he said, both of you in my office right now. So we went into his office with along with the operations Lieutenant. And he told his secretary, we don't want to be bothered unless it's extremely important. And so we went in there, sat down. The captain looked at Frank and said, what's wrong with your partner? And he says, I don't know. Why don't you ask him? And he looked at me, says, what's up, kid? 
And I said, well, first off, I'm sorry for blowing up like that. I said, you see, here it is. You know, if I want coffee in the morning, I get up and I got to go to 7-Eleven before I come into work because my wife doesn't get up and make me coffee. I said, this morning I get up, I ask the kids, I said, hey, where's mom? Oh, she got up early, went to the store because grandma spent the night, her mother spent the night at her house and she wanted to go make sure she had everything she needed for breakfast. I said, so here I get, I get up every goddamn morning. I want a cup of coffee. I go to 7-Eleven. Her mother comes down and she wakes up early to make sure we've got proper food for her. I said, I'm tired. And he got up and he was a big burly guy himself. He got up, poured a cup of coffee. He says, here's your cup of coffee, mule. He says, and the captain poured it for you. If anybody outside this room finds out that I was pouring coffee for you, your ass will be back pushing a radio car faster than you can spell your name. Am I understood? And I said, yes, sir. Put a big smile on my face. Made me laugh. And just then, secretary pops her head in. And he says, I thought we didn't want to be bothered. You said, unless it was important. I got the crime lab on the phone that say it's important. They need to talk to either Frank or Gil. Frank said, I'll take it. And so he took the phone call. He came back and he says, okay. They're telling me that the gun used to kill uh, the Zazaras is the same gun that was used to kill uh, Sai Lin Yu. And the same gun that was used to kill Dale Okazaki is the same gun that was used to kill uh, shit, I forget the name of the other victim, uh, Doi. So now we've got ballistics. And now we're in good, and it was the same gun used in uh, Sun Valley. And the ops lieutenant says, well, Gil, sounds to me like it's your time to go out in that squad room with 90 other investigators, jump up on a desk and start going, nah, 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 because you're the only one that's been right from the very beginning. And I said, we ain't got time to jump up on desks. We got work to do. And we went back out and hit it. And it was on, it wasn't really till, July the 5th that Frank was on board uh, with, uh, he knew it was a serial killer and he knew it was one guy. When all this information starts getting out in the media and the news is running with this stuff, what was the perception of the public going on? What Can you explain like how, and how that affected the investigation moving forward? They were panic stricken. The, the public, the public was panic stricken. They, everybody, you out trying to buy guns, out trying to buy locks, security gates, putting bars on their windows, they, they they went nuts. And as long as they were going nuts, the news media played it up to the hill, you know, put the fear of God in everybody. And it, it, they went out uh, June the 28th, they went out to pe- the case of Patty Lane Higgins. And what do you got, Gil? Well, a routine mundane murder. You know, you got a school teacher is killed. We don't know much yet other than she's inside. So we'll be working it. And four days later, on uh, July 2nd, there in the city of Arcadia, we were at the house of Mary Cannon. They roll up again and they said, hey, Gil, what are you and Frank doing at this one? Well, because we're out here working the other one in Arcadia and they're so close to each other. They said, you guys want to take it since they're that close to each other? And we said, sure, we'll take it. No problem. Well, what the office did tell us is they said, go look at it. If it's related to Patty Lane Higgins, keep it. If not, we got another crew we're sending out there to handle it. Well, we told the other crew, forget about it. Go on home. It's related. We'll take it. So we knew those two were related. And the media didn't make a big deal out of it because we're not making a big deal out of it, being being cool. On the 5th of July, we're at the home of Whitney Bennett. Now, Whitney Bennett was a surviving victim. So we're not mandated. Out here in L.A., if there's, if there's a murder, if there's a death, we're mandated to notify the press. Well, we didn't notify the press on that one because she didn't die and it wasn't a death. The city of Sierra Madre, where, where she did live, was a small city. It looked like she was going to die initially, but she didn't. But they asked if we would take it anyway because they got a very, very small police department, really small population. So we said, sure, we'll take it under mutual aid. And that was good up until the 7th of July when he raped Sophie Dickman, who survived. She acquiesced in his commands. And Joyce Nelson, he stomped her to death. He gave her a basal fracture. There was a, an imprint of a shoe, of a shoe right on the side of her head. 
And when the news media went to cover that one, they said, uh uh, something's going on. You guys are giving us the okie doke because you've been up in Arcadia for two. Now you're down in Monterey Park consulting with Monterey Park when it's not even your jurisdiction. No, something's going on. And they started, they got good people working for them, good investors. They started putting everything together. Then they went ahead and uh, started putting panic in the air. And one of the things, like, you know, so for those that watched the Netflix documentary, and there was a couple of articles about they said that, oh, they, they've made the cops look so good. And meanwhile, the public is the one that caught him, whatever. And I'm trying to explain to people, it's about the investigation that actually forces him out into the into the public when the public knows who he is. But, I mean, you're doing the detective work. You're, you're doing, I always say, you know, it's 101, looking for companion cases. Each case holds a clue to the other case. Keep on building it upon that. And a, a lot of times, you know, some of the media, when, you know, there were, it was kind of unfair when they talked about the investigation and actually what your role was and, and other, other detectives and Frank Salerno and everybody else. Yeah, that's just the way they sell it. Uh, if the public really knew the day that he was captured, was he captured by the citizens? Yes. But let yeah, me tell you what, what really happened. He's on a bus. When he gets back, uh, we by this time, we knew that he hung around. We positively identified him Friday, August 30th. And we knew we hung around the ground bus depot. We had uh, LAPD's SIS team sitting on the Greyhound bus depot. What we didn't know was he was coming into town because he had gone to Phoenix looking for a brother. Couldn't find his brother. His brother wasn't home. So he turned around and got on a Greyhound bus and came back. He came in the back door of the Greyhound bus station where the buses come in, where the public's not allowed. You get off the bus right there and then go inside uh, the depot itself. As soon as he stepped in, he noticed, man, there's too many people in here, people that don't belong, because the informant said he's going to make you right away. You can have undercover cops do all they want to, but their hair isn't dirty. Their teeth aren't all gone. They're not stained. They don't smell funky. Their clothes are dirty, but that's it. And so he was right. Richard walked in, saw too many people. No, this is bad. He walked out the way the bus came in. They missed him. He then started walking down the street, looked at a liquor store, saw his name on the front page of the paper because that's where it had gone out that the morning. And so he gets on a bus. If he makes it eight miles from downtown L.A. from where he was, he had a brother that was home and living there in East L.A. But he got uh, he probably got about five miles into his bus trip. Somebody made him on the bus passenger, stopped at a major major intersection, looked over. Oh, wow, that's him got off the bus immediately, pulled that cord, exit. Richard saw him because they were at a red light hitting the 911. He's dialing for cops. So Richard knows he's made. He goes down to the next major intersection and he gets off the bus there. Flags down a guy uh, in a gas company truck and says, follow that bus. The killer's on there. So they're following the bus. Richard sees, and he starts running, running across streets, running over fences. He gets to the five freeway, which is uh, right there. I believe it's a 10 lane, five lanes each way, major thoroughfare. And he goes over the sound wall, across the 10 lanes of the freeway, makes it to the north side of the freeway, runs up through the neighborhood there, jumping fences, going over walls from one yard to another, staying off the street. By this time, people in those houses are calling 911, calling the cops. That is LAPD's jurisdiction. So Richard runs as fast as he can, and he probably, it's a good two-mile jaunt that he has to go on. Coupled with, he was jumping the walls. He makes it, you cross the yellow div center dividing line on Indiana Street. The west side is LAPD. The east side is now the county area. He runs across that jurisdictional line, gets about a half block down, tries to carjack a lady for her car. She screams. They're in that part of town. There's only two kinds of Mexicans, good ones and bad ones. And the good ones all have a baseball bat or a pipe somewhere by their front door to protect them. And the bad ones, they all got their guns. Well, this was a nice family. He tries carjacking her. She screams. Husband grabs a piece of pipe, runs out and hits Richard a couple of times in the head with a pipe. 
and the neighbors hear this the struggle they see the fight hey that's our neighbor so they run out richard just leaves tries running away but he's exhausted and he only gets about four houses down before he just gives up they surround him they don't beat him they don't know who he is one little kid initially knows who it is tries telling them that's him and they keep telling the kid back off back off you're gonna get hurt and so they call the cops the one deputy in Los Angeles County who was a rookie at the time, he didn't know who it was. He just goes ahead and he gets every rookie's dream. The call he gets is citizen holding a felony suspect. So all he's going to do, they've already got him. He's just going to put his hooks on him, put him in a car, take some names in a short report and say, hey, this is what they alleged. This is what he did. And we got him. And now he's in jail. Well, that's what he did. He put him, he called paramedics for him first, which made him waste a little time. They came and they put gauze, looked like he's wearing a turban. They wrapped his head up with gauze. He's sitting in the backseat of the car. When here come the blue meanies from the, from the other side of the county line, they come in mass. And one guy, and the guy, and we're good friends. Uh, the guy's name is George Lopez, not the comedian actor, but <laughs> that, was, that was his name. And he goes up and he tells his guys, he says, hey, get him. Yeah, that's the guy. And tells Andy Ramirez, who's the one deputy that's there, yeah, he's the guy we've been chasing. That's ours. Takes him out of the car. Doesn't even give, you know, courtesy is you're going to change hands. You take your handcuffs off and they put theirs. They didn't even give Andy a chance to take his handcuffs. Slammed him in a black and white for LAPD. And there he goes. The rest of the cops from the sheriff's department at the station, they were so pissed off at Andy how could you let the biggest arrest in county history go? You know, you let them take them out of your car. What kind of voice are you? And so I get there and I'm laughing. I think it's, you know, I told the guys from East LA, hey, get over it. If it had been the other side, you guys would have done the same thing. Bottom line, he's in custody. I went up to Hollenbeck Station, which is LAPD's area. And there, the lieutenant from robbery homicide was already there. And he just said, Gilly's in that room over there. You call the shots. It's your case. You Whatever you want done. I said, first thing I want done, in a big room. And there must have been at least 60 cops up there. It was like a party atmosphere. I said, first thing we got to do is get everybody out of here. I don't want anybody up here. And this ain't a party. And he's in there. We got work to do. And so he did. Without hesitation, got everybody out, cleared it all off for us. And it was clearly our case. But it was the citizens caught him, but they caught a man that was thoroughly exhausted and just wanted to give up. So there wasn't a bunch of catching and beating and doing anything like they, like people think they did. And they still think that to this day. Uh, they were the nice people in the neighborhood. Had it been the bangers, the, the thugs in here, they'd have killed him <laughs> just because he was trying to harm somebody from their neighborhood. You know, you don't belong here. They'd have killed him, not even knowing who he was. And he actually makes a spontaneous utterance at the scene, right? He says, "It's me," kind of like, right? Yeah. I'm the guy. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was that was pretty big in that respect too. Yeah, it was. Well, it didn't make a difference. We we got him down to Hollenbeck we, before we did anything. Called somebody from Late Prince, come down here. I want a positive ID on him before we do anything. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Uh, I knew it was him, but let's just make things right. And so that's what they did before we went in and talked to them. Now, one of the things that, you know, we I didn't mention in some of the other crime scenes, you had uh, some pentagram stuff, right? Some sat satanic stuff. W was there like a, a cult um, investigator back in the day? Like they would uh, knew about, no. about all the stuff that you can No, we, we had a couple of guys that had studied it, but we didn't care the guy. The occult is nothing more, you know, Satanism is nothing more than, the opposite of Christianity. It's just another form of religion. And at time, one of the times that I was talking with Richard, he started making circles on the desktop. He's sitting right across from me and I never took my eyes off of him. And I said, go ahead and fill it in. He said, what do you mean fill it in? I said, put the, finish the pentagram. That's what you're getting ready to do. And he said, you know about that stuff? I said, yeah. I said, it doesn't bother me though. Go ahead, fill it in. And then he erased with his hand his imaginary pentagram that he was about to put in there. He believed in Satanism. 
And he got that because he was raised uh, Catholic and nobody in his family studies Satanism. He got into Satanism by meeting some friends and he was doing dope with them. And that's how he got into Satanism. And he believed in it. And I remember telling him, why don't you tell us this? In the end, after after sentencing and everything, I said, why, why can't you tell us? He said, well, I can't tell you. If, you know, if, uh, what do you call him? Uh, the devil uh, found out that I was hel- that I was helping you, he'd kick my ass. Mm-hmm. Lucifer. He said, if Lucifer found out I was helping you, he'd kick my ass when I go to hell. So I can't. So, Is there I anything you remember? I, I told him when he are you guys good enough to beat me in court? I said, don't you watch TV? The guys in the white hats always win. We're the good guys, Rich. We got you. Is there anything you remember from your interrogation of Ramirez that that maybe didn't make the, the uh, Netflix documentary or anything else out there that you they would say like there was kind of a, a tipping moment where you, he said something and you're like, wow, started connecting cases in your head? There was yeah, by that time knew the cases, you know, and right. and people often ask me, were you nervous or afraid going into this interview? Because you know you're going into somebody that's studied into the occult, you know, he's satanic and you're going in there and you know he's killed so many people and did this and that. No. Going into the interview is kind of like a quarterback in the NFL who drinks and parties with his buddies, goes home and he's a dad or a husband. And but come game day, game time, puts that helmet on everything else goes out of his mind and it's all about football. Well, when I'm on this side of the interview room outside before I going in, everything is out of your mind. You have a goal in mind. You know what you got to do. You're a professional. Go in there and get it done. So we went in there and Richard took a liking to me uh, more so than the others. And I don't know if it was because I was Hispanic because I could talk his type of lingo you know, from the streets, because I started out as a banger when I was a kid. Uh, I could communicate with him, and I understood him. And so we, we got along just well. And so I started talking to him. And when I'm conducting an interview or an interrogation, I like to play with people's anxiety first. I want to find out, you know, ask some control questions down here, you know, are you a man? You know, how old are you? What's your name? What's your address? And stuff like that, that I'm going to get straight answers for. Then I start talking to him about different subject matter and watch his anxiety level go up or watch it come down. So when we get to the meat of the investigation, I know what I can say and what I can't say. So I got around him and I was talking to him about his sister. And I was talking about his dad and had his dad molested his sister when she was young. And I could see him when I get questions about him and his dad and his sister, he started breathing heavy. It started almost to the point of hyperventilation. My partner Salerno was kneeing me underneath the table because I had him up there kneeing me underneath the table. And I really thought that I was getting ready to break Richard. Richard wanted to talk. And Frank is kneeing me underneath the table. And I didn't know if he was telling me, stop, bring him back down, or you got him, keep going. Because we didn't discuss what that meant before going into this interview. So I'm thinking in my mind, if I bring him back down, I can get him to go back up. But if I don't stop and he wants me to, it's going to be my ass when we get outside this room. Frank was the definitive leader. He was the Goomba. The, he was the Italian stallion. He was all of it. He was, he was the best. So I was afraid to get Frank pissed off at me. Plus it looked like the, I'll show you up here in the camera. This is the way Richard had his fist on the table and he's got his head now down to the side and he starts his heavy breathing. So, and his hands start to come up a little bit. And for a millisecond, for a millisecond, my heart said, oh, shit. If this guy starts levitating right now, I'm out of here. Because I've been shot at by bad guys. I've been shot at by good guys. I've been stabbed and I've been in fights. But nobody's ever asked me to fight somebody that's floating around the goddamn room. 
And for a millisecond, that scared me. And I just said, hey, Rich, you hungry? Want something to eat? And it was immediate. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I'm hungry. I could use some food. I said, all right, let's take a break. I'll come back. We'll get you some food, give you a chance to eat, and we'll come back and finish off. We walked outside the room, and first thing Frank says, why did you quit? You had him going, man. He was getting ready to roll. I said, well, you know, I, I didn't know him. We hadn't talked about this, Frank. And so we gave him some food and went back in there, talked to him, non-consequential later on. And when he did talk to us, he was talking to us in the third person. I mean, the Night Stalker may have done this, or the Night Stalker would have done this, the Night Stalker. Not him, because he wasn't a night stalker in his eyes, you know, to us anyway yet. And he said that he had to look, find a way to break it to his mom. Uh, and if he found that way, then, and we dropped the kitty cases, he would go ahead and uh, plead guilty to everything else. He said he wanted the death penalty. And he said, you can't have the death penalty and cop out. Because in a special search case, in order to do that, you need the concurrence of an attorney. I said, no attorney in his right mind is going to concur with you. That's the right thing to do to plead guilty. There's too many chances they could beat us in court. Legalities. and So you want to get the death penalty, fight it. And he said, okay. That's what he did. And he ends up uh, getting convicted, right? He got, um, how many charges? Was it 13, 14 homicide charges? 13 murders. He got 13 murders. 13 murders. And various other counts. He had so much time to do, even if they never would have killed him. You know, he'd, he'd have died in prison anyway. And Los Angeles, though, wasn't the only county, right? There was a murder in San Francisco with a Peter Pan, right? And yeah. there was a, how, did, how did those did those cases get included in, in that? Or no. Or? No. Matter of fact. They almost caused Gil to have a heart attack. San Francisco uh, <laughs> wanted to go ahead. They filed charges on mur one murder case. He was good for two up there, but they only filed one that was for sure case. And uh, they filed that murder. That was the Peter Pan murder. And uh, another Asian, him and his wife. And they filed it. And then they wanted to use... All of our cases from down in L.A. County, they wanted to bring them up there because then that would mean multiple murders, which meant death penalty case. And their D.A. up there in San Francisco at the time, uh, I want to say his name was Arlo. I can't remember his last name, but he was their D.A. And it was a, a year for uh, politics, and he was running for uh, his election year coming up. And the bad mouth on him was he was soft on crime. So he wanted the vote. So he showed everybody that he was going to file multiple murders. And I was so dead set against that because by the time they got our people up there to testify in their case up there, it would have been at least minimally eight years after the crime had occurred in L.A. County. And if these people change their testimony at all, if their minds weren't as sharp as they were when they testified in L.A. County, that could have been grounds for throwing our case out and having to retry it. So I got a, I got a subpoena. They wanted all police files. And I just flat out told them, you ain't going to get them. You know, and then I went to, to the sheriff and I asked our sheriff, I said, Hey, you gotta get, you first off, they're subpoenaing me too. And I'll tell you right now, boss, I ain't going unless you give me county council to go with me to represent me to keep me out of jail because here's what they want and I ain't giving it up and they can't force me. whoever wrote the warrant didn't know what they were doing I'm not the custodian of records for all other police departments even though I had the reports I'm not in charge of their so we flew up there and I said we had a meeting with the DA before we went before the judge and told the DA hey this is what's going on this is what they want and the, I was ready to kill my own county council because they said, okay, Gil, so nothing was wrong with you turning down the subpoena. We understand that. And you're within that. You're right. You don't, you're not responsible for every, all the other agencies' records. That's up to them. He says, but maybe just to make things easy, we can help them. You can get in touch with the other agencies. And say, hey, these guys want to do it. Give your permission. You can collect them. And then that way they don't have to go to 
each and every agency. And I said, like I told them before, I'll give them all of my reports. They want it from the other agencies. I don't want to be any part of it. I don't want to get any mixed up. They're going to have to do it on their own if they want it. And so that's what they did. They kept me out of jail and I didn't have to go back there. And what they came up with the decision was they would call Richard in, allow him to waive time. And they would not take him to trial on that other case. Our case was conviction. If our case got overturned on appeal, then they would file their case. But if it didn't get filed on appeal, they would stay out of it. And that's what they ended up doing. Right. Or just what I would have done, exceptional clearance, call it a day and move, and move on. Right. I yeah. mean, that would have been, that would have been the easiest. Another, they found another case when DNA finally came in. Yeah. 2010. Uh, they found a uh, case of a little girl. I believe she was 10 years old. And he had uh, murdered and raped her as well. Right. It is an absolute amazing story, and it's actually when you think about it, it's living history, right? I mean, this is, it is. this is something that goes down in the in the annals of history. Uh, Gil, I want to thank you for your time. This has been fascinating. We're up to 117 people watching this live. You had a lots of great. You have a lot of fans in the chat. I don't know oh, if you saw you. that. People, people, I, I uh, thank, people. I thank them all. Yep, it has been fantastic. I enjoyed this too. Here in the first count of uh, this uh, case and this, you know, famous case or infamous case, however you want to define it as. I uh, just want to thank you again, Gil. I want to thank everybody for watching. And if you're watching this on the replay, I appreciate that too. Everybody, you have a great day. Hang on one second, Gil. I'm going to end this.